Midnight Beat Train. Jan Kaufman was no longer new to the city. The Palace of Delights, he'd always called it, in the days of his innocence. But that was when he'd lived in Atlanta, and New York was a, still a kind of promised land where anything and everything was possible. Now Kaufman had lived three and a half months in his dream city, and the Palace of Delights seemed less than delightful. Was it really only a season since he stepped out of Port Authority bus station and looked up 42nd Street towards Broad the Broadway intersection? So sure a time to lose so many treasured illusions. He was embarrassed now even to think of his night night ugh. It made him wince to remember how he had stood and announced aloud, New York, I love you. Love? Never. But I had best been an infatuation. And now, after only three months living in with his object of adoration, spending his days and nights in her presence, she had lost her aura of perfection. New York was just a city. He had seen her wake in the morning like a slut, and pick murdered men from between her teeth, and suicides from the tangles of her hair. He had seen her later at night, her dirty black back streets shamelessly courting depravity. He had watched her in the hot afternoon, sluggish and ugly, indifferent to the atrocities that were being committed every hour in her throttled passages. It was no palace of delights. It bred death, not pleasure. Everyone he met had brushed with violence. It was a fact of life. It was almost chic to have known someone who had died in a violent death. It was proof of living in that city. The Coffin had li loved New York from afar for almost 20 years. He planned his love affair for most of his adult life. It was not easy, therefore, to shake the passion off, as though he had never felt it. There were times, still times, very early before the cop sirens began or at twilight, when Manhattan was still a miracle. For those moments, and for the sake of his dreams, he still gave her the benefit of the doubt, even when her behavior was less than ladylike. She didn't make such forgiveness easy. In the few months like Kaufman had lived in New York, her streets had been washed with spilt blood. In fact, it was not so much the streets themselves, but the tunnels beneath the streets. Subway slaughter was the catchphrase of the month. Only the previous week, another three killings had been reported. The bodies had been discovered in one of the subway cars on the Avenue of the Americas, half open and partially disemboweled, as though an efficient operator operative had been interrupted in his work. These killings were so thoroughly professional that the police were interviewing every man on their records who had some past connection with the, the butchery trade. The meat packing, packaging plants on the waterfront were being watched, the slaughterhouses scoured for clues. A swift arrest was promised, though none was made. This recent trio of corpses was not the first to be discovered in such a state. The very day that Coffin had arrived, a story had broken in the, new, in the times that was still the talk of every morbid secretary in the office. The story went that a German visitor lost in the subway system late at night had come across a body in a train. The victim was a well-built, attractive 30-year-old woman from Brooklyn. She had been completely stripped. Every shed of her clo clothing, every article of jewelry, even the studs in her ears. More bizarre than the stripping was the neat and systematic way in which the clothes had been folded and placed in individual plastic bags on the seat beside the corpse. This was no irrational slaughter at, slasher at work. This is a highly organized mind, a lunatic with a strong sense of tidiness. Further, and yet more bizarre than the careful stripping of the corpse, was the outrage that had been perpetrated upon it. Reports claimed, though the police department failed to confer confirm this, that the body had been meticulously shaved. Every hair had been removed from the head, from the groin, and from beneath the arms, all cut and scarred scorched back to the flesh. Even the eyebrows and eyelashes had been plucked out. Finally, this all too naked slab had been flung, hung by the feet from one of the holding handles set in the roof of the car, a black plastic bucket lined with a black plastic bag, 
and had been placed beneath the corpse to catch the steady fall of blood from its wounds. In that state, stripped, shaved, suspended, and practically blood light, the body of Loretta Dyer had been found. It was disgusting, it was meticulous, and it was deeply confusing. There had been no rape, nor any sign of torture. The woman had been swiftly and efficiently dispatched as though she would, was a piece of meat, and the butcher was still loose. The city fathers, in their wisdom, declared a complete close-down on the press reports of the slaughter. It was said that the man who found the, who had found the body was in protective custody in New Jersey, outside of inquiring journalists. But the cover-up had failed. Some greedy cop had leaked the salient details to a reporter from the Times. Everyone in New York now knew the horrible story of the slaughters. It was a topic of conversation every deli and bar, and of course on the subway. But Loretta Dyer had been the first. Now three more bodies had been found in identical circumstances, though the work had clearly been interrupted on this occasion. Not all of the bodies had been shaved and the jugulars had not been severed to bleed them. There was another more significant difference in discovery. It was not a tourist who stumbled on the site, it was a reporter from the New York Times. Huffin sur surveyed the report and that sprawled across the front page of the newspaper. He had no appearance to interest in the story, unlike his elbow mate along the counter of the deli. All he felt was mild disgust that made him push his plate of overcooked eggs aside. It was simply further proof of this, his city's decadence. He would take no pleasure in her sickness. Nevertheless, being human, he did not completely ignore the gory details on the page in front of him. The article was unsensationally written, but the simple clarity of the style made the subject more appalling. He couldn't help wondering, too, about the men behind the atrocities. Was there one psychotic loose or several, each inspired to copy the original murder? Perhaps this was the only, only the beginning of the horror. Maybe more murders would follow. Until at last the murderer, in its exhilaration or exhaustion, would step behind beyond caution and be taken. Until then, the city, Coffin's adored city, would live in a state somewhere between hysteria and ecstasy. At his elbow, a bearded man knocked over Coffin's coffee. Shit, he said. Coffin shifted in his stool to avoid the dribble of the coffee running off the counter. Shit, the man said again. Oh, no harm done, said Coffin. He looked at the man with a slightly disdainful expression on his face. The clumsy bastard was attempting to soak up the coffee with a napkin, which was turned to mush as he did so. <coughs> Coffin found himself wondering if this elf with his florid cheeks and uncultivated beard was capable of murder. Was there any sign on that overfed face and included in the shape of his head or in the turn of his small eyes that gave his true nature away? The man spoke one another. Coughlin shook his head. Coffee, regular dark. The elf said to the girl behind the counter, she looked up from the cleaning grill of the cold, of cold fat. Huh? Coffee, you deaf? The man grinned at Coff, then deaf. Coff and nosed he had three teeth missing from his lower jaw. Looks bad, huh? He said. What do you mean? The coffee? The absence of the teeth? Three people like that. Carved up. Coff nodded. Makes it think. Sure. I mean, it's a cover-up, isn't it? They know who did it. This conversation's ridiculous, thought Kaufman. He took off his spectacles and pocketed them. The bearded face was no longer in focus. There's some improvements, at least. Bastards, fucking bastards, all of them. I'll lay you anything as a cover up. A what? They got the evidence. They're just keeping us all in the fucking dark. There's nothing, something out there that's not human. Kaufman understood. 
It was a conspiracy theory the oaf was trotting out. He heard them to so, uh, heard them so often a panacea. See, they all, all do this cloning stuff, and it gets out of hand. They can be grown fucking monsters for all we know. There's something down there that I won't tell us about. Cover it, I say. Leave anything. Kaufman found the man certainly certainty attractive. Monsters on the prowl, six heads, do a dozen eyes. Why not? He knew why not, because I excuse, excused his city, but let her off the hook. Coffin believed in his heart. The monsters to be found in the tunnels were perfectly human. The mirrored man threw his money on the counter and got up, sliding his fat bottom off the stained plastic stool. Probably fucking cough, he said, as his parting shot. I tried to make a fucking hero and made a fucking monster instead. He grinned grotesquely. Lay at anything. He continued and lumbered out without another word. Kaufman slowly exhaled through his nose, feeling the sensation tension in his body abate. He hated that sort of confrontation. It made him feel tongue-tied and infectual. Couldn't think of it. He hated that kind of man. The opinionated brute that New York bred so well. It was coming to six when Mahogany awoke. The morning rain had turned into a light drizzle by twilight. The air was about as clear smelling as it ever got in Manhattan. He stretched on his bed, threw off the dirty blanket, and got up for work. In the bathroom, the rain was dripping on the box of the air conditioner, filling the apartment with a rhythmical slapping sound. Mahogany turned on the television to cover this noise, disinterested in anything that it had to offer. He went to the window, six, the street six floors below was thick with traffic and people. After a hard work, day's work in New York was on its way home to play, to make love. People were streaming out of their offices and into their automobiles. Some would be testy after a day's sweaty labor in a badly aired office. Others, benign as sheep, would be wandering home down the avenues ushered by a ceaseless current of bodies. Still others would, even now, be cramming onto the subway, blind to the graffiti on every wall, deaf to the babble of their own voices and to the cold thunder of the tunnels. It pleased Mahogany to think of that. He was, after all, not one of the cone herd. He could stand at his window and look down on a thousand heads below him, and know he was a chosen man. He had deadlines to meet, of course, like the people in the street, but his work was not their senseless labor. It was more like a sacred duty. He needed to live, and sleep, and shit like them, too. It was not a financial necessity that drove him, but the demands of history. He was in a great tradition that stretched from further back than America. He was a night stalker, like Jack the Ripper, like Gilles de a living embodiment of death, a wraith with a human face. He was a haunter of sleep and awakener of terrors. The people below him could not know his face, nor would care to look twice at him. But his stare caught them and weighed them up, selecting only the ripest from the passing parade, choosing only the healthy and the young to fall under his sanctified knife. Sometimes Mahogany longed to announce his identity to the world. They had responsibilities and they bore on him heavily. He couldn't expect fame. His was a secret life and it was merely pride that longed for recognition. He, after all, he thought, does the beef salute the butcher as it throbs it to its knees? All in all, he was content. To be part of that great tradition was enough would always have to remain enough. Recently, however, there had been discoveries. They were his fault, of course. No good buddy could possibly blame him, but it was a bad time. Life was not as easy as it had been ten years ago. He was that much older, of course, and that made his job more exhausting, and more and more the obligations weighed on his shoulders. He was a chosen man, and that was a difficult privilege to live with. He wondered, now and then, if it wasn't time to think about training a younger man for his duties. 
There would need to be consultations with the fathers, but sooner or later a replacement would have to be found, and it would be, he felt, a criminal waste of his experience not to take on an apprentice. There were so many felicities he could pass on, tricks of his extraordinary trade, the best way to stalk, to cut, to strip, to bleed, the best meat for the purpose, the simplest way to dispose, dispose of the remains, so much detail, so much accumulated expertise. Mahogany wandered down into the bathroom and turned on the shower. As he stepped in, he looked down at his body, a small paunch, the graying hairs on his sagging chest, the scars and the pimples that littered his pale skin. He was getting old. Still, tonight, like every other night, he had a job to do. Kaufman hurried back into the lobby with his sandwich, turning down his collar and brushing rain off his hair. The clock above the elevator read 617. He would work through the room until 10, no later. The elevator took him up to the 12th floor into the Pathos office. He trapezed unhappily through the maze of empty desks and hooded machines to his little territory, and was, which was still illuminated. Women who cleaned the offices were chatting down the corridor, otherwise the place was lifeless. He took off his coat, shook the rain off it as best as he could, hung it up, and then he sat down in front of the piles of orders he had been tussling with for the best part of three days and began to work. It would only take one more night's labor, he felt sure, to break the back of the job. He found it easier to concentrate without the incessant clatter of typists and typewriters on every side. He wrapped his ham on whole wheat with extra mayonnaise and settled in for the evening. It was nine now. Mahogany was dressed for the night shift. He had his usual sober suit on, his brown tie neatly knotted, his silver cufflinks, a gift from his first wife, placed in the sleeves of his immaculately pressed shirt thinning hair gleaming with oil, his nails snipped and polished, his face flushed with cologne. His bag was packed, the towels, the instruments, his chainmail apron. He checked his appearance in the mirror. He could, he thought, still be taken for a man of 45, 50 on the outside. He surveyed his face as, as he surveyed his face, he reminded himself of his duty. Above all, he must be careful. There would be eyes on him every step of the way, watching his performance tonight, judging it. He must walk out like an innocent, arousing no suspicion. If only, if they only knew, he thought, the people who walked, ran, and skipped past him on the streets, who collided with him without apology, who met his gaze with contempt, who smiled at his bulk, looking uneasily with his ill-fitting suit. If only they knew what he did, what he was, and what he carried. Caution, he said to himself, and turned off the light. The apartment was dark. He went to the door and opened it, used to walking in the blackness, happy in it. The rain clouds had cleared entirely. Mahogany made his way down Amsterdam towards the subway on 145th Street. Tonight he'd take the Avenue of the Americas again, his favorite line, often the most productive. Down the subway steps, token in hand, through the automatic gates, the smell of the tunnels had was in his nostrils now. Not the smell of the deep tunnels, of course. They had a scent all their own, but there was reassurance even in the stale electric air of his shallow line. For curtailed breath of a million travelers circulated and was worn mingling with the breath of creatures far older, things with voices soft like clay whose appetites were abominable. How he loved it. The scent, the dark, the thunder. He stood on the platform and scanned his fellow travelers, travelers critically. There were one or two bodies he contemplated falling, but there were no, so much trust amongst them, so few worth the chase. The physically wasted, the beast, the ill, the weary, bodies destroyed by excess and by indifference, as a professional it sickened him, 
though he understood the weakness that spoiled the best of men. He lingered in the station for over an hour, wandering between platforms while the trains came and went, came and went, and the people with them. There was so little of quality around that was dispiriting. It seemed he had to wait longer and longer every day to find flesh worthy of use. It was almost past ten, and he had not seen a single creature who was really ideal for slaughter. No matter, he told himself. There was time yet. Very soon the theater crowd would be emerging. There, always, there were always good for a sturdy body or two. Well, fell, fed intelligent intelligence, clutching at their ticket stubs and pinning on the divisions of art. Oh yes, there'd be something there. If not, there were nights when it seemed he could never find it, anything suitable. He'd ride downtown and corner a couple of lovers out late, or find an athlete or two, fresh from one of the gyms. They were always sure to offer good material, except that, with such healthy spe specimens, there was always the risk of resistance. I remember catching two black bucks a year ago or more, with maybe 40 years between them, father and son perhaps. They had resisted with knives, and he had been hospitalized for six weeks. There had been a worse thought encounter than, and one that sent him Doubting his skills, worse, made him feel wonder what his masters would have done with him had he fa suffered a fatal injury. Would he have been delivered to his family in New Jersey and given a decent Christian f funeral, or would his carcass have been thrown into the dark for their own use? The headline of the New York Post discarded on the seat across him caught Mahogany's eye. Police all out to catch killer. He couldn't resist a smile. Thoughts of failure, weakness, and death evaporated. After all, he was that man, that killer, and tonight the thought of capture was laughable. After all, wasn't his career sanctioned by the highest possible authorities? No policeman could hold him, no court pass judgment on him. The very forces of law and order that made such a show of his pursuit served his masters no less than he. He almost wished some two-bit cop would catch him, make him triumph before the judge, just to see the looks on their faces when the word came from the dark that Mahogany was a protected man above every law on the statute books. It was now well after 10.30. The creature, the trickle of theater goers had begun, but there was nothing likely so far. They'd want to let the pass rush pass anyway. Just follow one or two pieces to the end of the line. He bided his time like any wise hunter. Kaufman was not finished by eleven. An hour after he promised himself release, but exasperation and ennui were making the job more difficult, and the sheets of figures were beginning to blur in front of him. At ten past eleven, he threw down his pen and admitted defeat. He rubbed his hot eyes and with the cushions of his palms till his head filled with colors. <sighs> Fuck it, he said. He never swore in company, but once in a while to say bucket to himself was a great consolation. He made his way out of the office, a damp coat over his arm, and headed for the elevator. His limbs felt drugged and his eyes would scarcely stay open. It was colder outside than he had anticipated. The air brought him out of his lethargy for a while. He stepped walked towards the subway on 34th Street, catch the express to Far Rockway, home in an hour. Neither Kaufman nor Mahogany knew it, but at 96th and Broadway, the police had arrested what they took to be the subway killer, having trapped him in one of the up-down town trains. A small man of European extraction, holding a hammer and saw, had cornered a young woman in the second car and threatened to cut her in half in the name of Jehovah. Whether he was capable of fulfilling his threat was doubtful. As it was, he didn't get the chance. All the rest of the passengers, including two marines, looked on. 
The intended victim landed a kick to the man's testicles. He dropped the hammer. She picked it up and broke his lower jaw right and right cheekbone with it because the Marine stepped in. <coughs> when the trains halted at 96, the police were waiting to arrest the subway butcher. They pushed the car, rushed the car in a whore, yelling like banshees and scared as shit. The butcher was lying on the one corner of his car, his face in pieces. He carted him away, triumphant. The woman, after questioning, went home with the Marines. It was to be a useful diversion, though a mahogany couldn't know it at the time. It took the police the best part of the night to determine the identity of their prisoner, chiefly because he couldn't do anything more than drool through his shattered jaw. It was not until 3.30 in the morning that one Captain Davis, coming on duty, recognized the man as a retired flower salesman from the Bronx called Hank Vassarle. Hank, it seemed, was regularly arrested for his threatening behavior and indecent exposure, all in the name of Jehovah. Appearance was deceived. He was about as dangerous as the Easter Bunny. This was not the subway slaughterer, but by the time the cops had figured that out, Mahogany had been about his business in a long while. 